Okay, so my name is Bill Dempster, and I was director of systems engineering for the Biosphere 2 project in the beginning. Things have changed quite a lot since then, but I'm going to mostly show you, or I guess entirely show you pictures from the early days, starting uh, with this one, of course. And this is a very special audience that I have. The audiences that I have usually given presentations show, they haven't known much about Biosphere, but you guys are here and, and know a lot, you see a lot, you're working with it, etc. So why should I hash over all that for, for you guys? No. I'm going to talk about um, some of the very particular details. And in particular, I'm going to talk about how do you make it airtight. And that might seem like a simple problem, but you're going to find out, I hope, that it's not such a simple problem. OK, so I'm particularly going to talk about those two chambers there. And I think all of you probably know they're called lungs. But uh, that's actually a misnomer. Because our lungs, their purpose is to exchange gases between the inside of our body and the outside air. These lungs were named simply because of the analogy of expansion and contraction. But there's no exchange of gases going on. So, um, and then I'm going to go into that in a lot of detail. Uh, but of course, you all know pretty much what that is. So, next slide. OK, what's the problem? The central problem about sealing Biosphere 2, or for that matter, any closed little experimental chamber that you might want, is the expansion and contraction of air. Now, air, What people say, well, what's this stuff? It's just fluff. You know, it doesn't amount to anything. And I'm sure most of you have heard the idea that a fish has no concept of water. Well, I'll turn that around and say people have no concept of air. Of course you do. You know that wind blows and, and all that. But you may not know that in your head and intellectually, but in terms of your gut and what you experience and you feel, air seems like practically nothing. Um, so, but if you do a little thinking and calculating about it, uh, uh, it turns out that that's not true. Um, the big issue is the pressure that exists between the inside of, in this case, Biosphere 2 and the outside. If you're going to make it sealed so that it doesn't leak air. And well, why should there be um, any um, pressure? I mean, I don't feel any pressure. What's the pressure? I don't feel any. Um, um, but there are three things that have an influence on what the pressure is. Um, and I start out by saying expansion contraction. Well, there are three factors. The inside temperature. Now, most of you probably know that uh, if air gets warmer, it expands. And if it gets colder, it contracts. That's relatively simple. But there are two other factors as well. There's the inside humidity. So there's moist air and there's dry air. But humidity is actually water dissolved in air. It's water vapor in air. And so if you have a puddle of water and it evaporates into the air, that means that there's actually an increase in the amount of gas, because water vapor is a gas. So when the water evaporates and goes into the air, you're actually increasing the amount of gas that's contained uh, 
in your container, whatever it is, whether it's Biosphere 2 or one of these little Folsom spheres that you see around, uh, whatever. And of course, if you increase the amount of gas, that would represent an expansion. Or if you decrease the amount of gas, that would represent a contraction. So that's the other thing. And then there's the outside barometric pressure. So um, outside, the bar barometric pressure is varying all the time. And since we're concerned about, and I'll tell you why we're concerned about it in a minute, um, the pressure between the inside and the outside, when the barometric pressure outside surrounding us increases, that means that it's compressing and so increasing the outside pressure, or the reverse, if it decreases, that's releasing the outside pressure. And uh, so, uh, next slide. So here, this is not from this site. This is from another site in New Mexico. But the idea is the same. This is how the barometric pressure varied in the sample that I took for 120 days. And it's similar here. Of course, it's not going to be identical or the same. But it goes up and down a lot. And then there's also a maximum temperature and maximum minimum temperature on the inside. This happened to be for something else that was not biosphere 2. But biosphere 2's temperature changes are much more extreme than what's illustrated there. Next slide. And I talked about the water vapor. This is minimum and maximum of specific humidity, which is a technical sounding term, but it just amounts to how much water vapor there is in the air. And these vary. Um, these, all these measurements were done over a period of 120 days. So all of these are creating pressures. Now, if you just do the simple back of the envelope calculation on the basis of what's the ideal gas law, which people learn about in high school, nothing very uh, uh, sophisticated, you very quickly find out that the pressures that are created <coughs> are so much that they would destroy this structure. They're big. There are a lot. And I'm talking about like 100 pounds per square foot. You know, a square foot, 100 pounds, both directions, outward and inward. So it could either explode or it could get crushed. Um, so um, now, why doesn't that happen right now? Why isn't this building exploding? and uh, or getting crushed well because it leaks it leaks all over the place not the original version of biosphere 2 but this version does because it's been altered since the original version which was built in uh, late 1980s to early 1990s and um, it leaks a lot so when the air expands, it just goes out the cracks around the door, or the window, or thousands of cracks that are everywhere. And when the contraction happens, the reverse happens, outside air flows in. Uh, so that, in any ordinary building, that's continually relieving the development of pressure. And it's not an issue. But our objective was to make Biosphere 2 airtight so that it wouldn't leak. And if we hadn't done uh, those uh, lungs that I pointed to earlier, um, it, uh, it would have been destroyed. Um, so um, next slide. Now this is a detail of what's, what's underneath those domes that we looked at before. This is a steel tank. It's 158 feet in diameter. And in the center of it, there's an aluminum dish or pan, if you might call it that. 
which is at the moment, as you see it there, sitting, just sitting there, and you see that little hole right there in the floor? That's the tunnel that connects it underground to Biosphere 2. And the purpose of that is to allow the air to flow back and forth between Biosphere 2 and the bottom of this tank. And then this is covered over with a flexible membrane so that when the air expands in Biosphere 2, it can flow through the tunnel, come up under the membrane, the membrane can rise, and the whole thing, the whole air volume can expand without creating pressure. So next slide. That's the tunnel that connects eight feet diameter. Next slide. Okay, here is now the membrane being put into place. And remember I pointed out that aluminum pan, that's that right there. And the edge of the tank is right here, right there. And it goes all the way around. And there they are drawing that membrane in, in place all around. Next slide. So this now is after the membrane has been attached to the pan and the edge of the tank and the air has expanded enough so that it is pushing up underneath and it's raised that aluminum pan off the floor including the membrane and that weighs 20 tons and it's just the expansion of air and you don't even feel it but in this case this is only very sh small amount of rise maybe six or eight feet or something like that the range of travel that it is designed for was 45 feet of, uh, of movement. Next slide. And then that's looking over the top, but underneath the dome. The dome is in the background and seeing how these membranes are billowing up. Next slide. Now this is an illustration of what we've talked about so here is the tank that I talked about right there, 24 feet high on the sides and 158 feet uh, diameter. And there's the membrane that was drawn between the two. And that's the rigid aluminum pan that was there. And this is the tunnel that goes underground to Biosphere 2. And then that is the dome over the top. And when the air f expands in Biosphere 2, it flows through the tunnel like this, comes up under and raises it up. And when the air contracts by cooling or condensation or the uh, um, increase, um, decrease, I should say, uh, in pressure of the uh, outside atmosphere, then the reverse happens and the pan and the membrane fall down. But there's still another problem. The other problem is, which is much, much less, by the way, much, much less, is that ordinarily the weight of that pan and membrane resting on top of the air will create pressure just by its weight resting on the air. And that pressure through the air is transmitted throughout the whole system through biosphere two. So, but it's much less. I mean, like 50 times less. I mean, not a little bit less, a lot less. Um, um, but still, there's a little bit of a problem because let's suppose there are leaks in biosphere two, which of course there will be. How can you build a structure so complex as this without having a leak somewhere? You know, there's just inevitably is just going to be. Well, then, of course, the weight of that resting on the air creates a little bit of pressure. And then that's going to try to drive the air out through whatever leaks there are. And so then the next thing that was devised was that this dome that's over there is primarily as a weather cover just to protect it, it all from the weather. 
but it's also not airtight, but air resistant, near, close to airtight, not completely. And so this fan that's installed right at the edge like that blows outward of the air that's under the dome but above the membrane. And by blowing outward, it creates a, a little bit of vacuum, a little bit of suction. And then that gives a lift to that. And this is controlled, the fan is controlled in such a way as to exactly neutralize the pressure that's created by the weight. And when I say exactly neutralize, I mean within about one thousandth of a pound per square inch. That was the objective. Okay, so now you have Biosphere 2, even if it has a few leaks, which in inevitably it must have some somewhere, there's no driving pressure that is going to force the air in or out through those leaks. And that is the uh, primary way, that's the, the, the central problem and the solution to the problem was to provide expansion and contraction ability of the system so that pressures would not be created between the inside and the outside. Uh, next slide. Okay, now there's a test. Well, how much does it leak? So in the first month after the initial closure for 25 days, what we did was we turned off the fan in the dome and we let the weight of the membrane be on the air because we knew that that would force any air through leaks outward. And so what we did to measure the leak rate was to measure how fast did the membrane de decline. We just watched it go down. And this is what we observed. And this is a, a statement of the volume of air in moles. But by the way, at our location, a mole, which is a term familiar to chemists, is approximately equal to one cubic foot. So when you see moles on that, you can say cubic feet times 10 to the 6, which means times a million. So between 5.4 and 5.7 million cubic feet of air in the system just sitting for 25 days under the pressure of the pan and the membrane resting on the air. Then here is the lung declining. And of course, because of the variations in temperature and humidity and barometric pressure, we would get these little wiggles. So if all you did was do this for like one day, uh, you would be all very confused. You'd see up and down, up and down, what is going on. But you let that go for a long time, 25 days, and then the trend becomes very, very clear. So that's the line of the trend. So the result of that was that we got a measure of what the leak, of how big the leaks are. This is the aggregate of all the leaks, not even knowing where they are. Don't have to know exactly where they are, or what size each individual one is. That's a measurement of how much they are. Well, how much does that correspond to if you do the calculations? That corresponds to a single hole that's the diameter of my little finger, three quarters of an inch, in the entire structure. All the glazing, all the, um, I haven't mentioned the liner yet, by the way. Um, I, I will mention that. I'll just mention it briefly now. Underneath the bottom, you can't just put it on the ground. The ground's all, air goes through the ground. It's, lots of air goes through the ground. So on the bottom, and concrete is porous. Concrete is not sealed too. Well, it develops cracks, we all know that. But it's porous as well. So concrete is not airtight either. 
So we had to put a liner, a stainless steel liner, under it all. And the edges come up and join to the bottom of the glazing system at the edges in an airtight manner. So in other words, it was completely sealed. Next slide. OK, and then how after the first 25 days, and by the way, after that, we turned the fans back on and neutralized the pressure again so that we could continue our two years and more of operation with the pressure being made identical to the outside pressure all the time, as close as we could get. But then how do you also verify your notion of what it being airtight is. Well, the entire atmosphere throughout all Biosphere 2 was spiked with a trace gas. And we used two of them. Actually, three were used. But one of them was sulfur hexafluoride, which is a inert, biologically inert gas, but easily detectable in, in some parts per million. And the other one was helium which exists in our atmosphere, but it was spiked into the increase. Um, here it is. It was about 100 parts per million helium. And here it is, uh, sulfur hexafluoride, about 175. Uh, no, sorry, I did it backwards. Helium uh, was more like uh, 370 parts per million. Sulfur hexafluoride was about 70 parts per million. So th this is number of days, 200 to 600. Well, OK, 230 to 580. So in other words, for a year, we would measure the concentration of helium and sulfur hexafluoride remaining in the air. Because, and I need to back up for a minute, because when I talk about a leak, I'm not talking about a leak just outward or just inward. I'm talking about exchange of air between the inside and the outside. So if we were exchanging air between the inside and the outside all the time, what would happen is that when the air goes out, some of the trace gases would also go out. And then when some leaked back in, they would then be diluted by the new outside clean air that had come in. So the question is, how, did the, uh, how much dilution was there of the trace gases? And the point is, there was practically none. And that's over a year. Next slide. OK, now here's another thing, again, measuring from this, not on this side, but another side. If you ask yourself the question um, of uh, how much leakage would occur every day according to the formulas that I made from temperature variation, barometric pressure variation, and humidity variation, causing expansion contraction. And you can calculate how much expansion contraction it is. Well, how much leakage would that create if you have a leaky building every day? Well, every one of those little squares is a representative of the leak in terms of percentage of the size of the building, ranging in this graph from 4 to 14% over a period of 0 to 120 days. And it varies. Every day is different. And you get a different square for every day, the amount of leak. Just assuming that the expansion that occurred let air go out, and then the contraction occurred drew in outside air. Then that tells you. And this shows, comparatively, the top line is the persistence of the original air you have in the system over a period of 120 days. And that's what it would be for Biosphere 2. And if you just let it leak, uh, 
as it would because of these variations in pressure, then that's the persistence of original error. In other words, it goes to zero. And in, if you want to do an experiment where you're going to study the biological exchange of gases in the system, and you want to know what that exchange is like, and you want to see it and be able to measure it, you can't afford to have a leak that takes your air, original air down to zero. And that was a fundamental idea of Biosphere 2, was that we would study this dynamic relationship of the plants and animals and the gases they exchange by measuring them. But in order to do that, you've got to have knowledge that it's not leaking. Next slide. Case in point, so much is made about the problem of oxygen in Biosphere 2. Big scandal in the media. Well, that was the purpose of Biosphere 2, was to find out what happens. And of course, we did find out. We found out that our initial configuration of the system wasn't perfect. We knew it wouldn't be. The idea was to make an approximation and to see how well it behaved and with the idea that we would make changes and continue. And by the way, what is also hardly ever recognized is that Biosphere 2 was intended to operate for 100 years, for a century, well beyond our lifetimes. And that uh, the whole idea was that we're going to discover how biospheres operate. And a central point of that is the whole question of what the dynamic balance is of the different kinds of gases, particularly carbon dioxide and oxygen. So, and notice how many days we're talking about, zero to 500 days. That's 16 months from the time starting there to the time there. So oxygen started at normal ambient pressure, uh, partial pressure in the atmosphere, 21%. And it slowly declined. And this is the curve that shows what that decline looked like all the way down to 14 and a little under 14 and a half percent. Um, but now the question is, would we have even noticed if it leaked? And I'm going to show you the next graph. OK. Now, I did a little theoretical study, hypothetical, computer simulation, if you will. So curve B, B for biosphere, well, I don't know. But anyway, that's the actual, if we assume biosphere leaks 10% per year, and which, by the way, I think it might have been less, but I can't prove it, so I won't claim it's less. But let's say it leaked 10% per year. And this was the curve that I just showed you on the last graph. That's curve B. Then I calculated what would that curve look like if Biosphere 2 hadn't leaked at all, absolute zero. Well, that's curve A. And you can see there's hardly any difference between A and B. And then I ran a whole bunch of other curves. Uh, just theoretically, hypothetically, just making up percentages of leakage like curve C, suppose it leaked 50% per year, then that would be curve C. And if it would leak 100% per year, in other words, if every year we replaced all the air in Biosphere 2 with, with new air, then you would see that oxygen curve be curve D. Well, you would still notice definitely going down. But now let's look at these other curves. 400% per year, that's essentially 1% every day. That would be that curve E. And well, OK, you sort of notice at the beginning, but maybe you don't really notice as it goes on. And now curve F, 1.9% per day. 
and why did I choose that number? It's a ridiculous number. Well, because somebody who was familiar with the space program told me that that's how much the space shuttle leaked. 1.9% every day. And so with that, that's that curve F, um, which, uh, you know, so means on the space shuttle, it leaks too much for them to even tell. And now what's 10% per day? Well, if you remember that pre earlier graph where I showed the persistence of original air, that was about 10% per day. But I'll tell you another story. And that other story is that I went to a closed systems conference in 1992 in Alabama. And there was a presenter from NASA that got up. And he got up. And they have a biomass production chamber where they grow plants so they can measure how much food they can produce for people that are going to live on Mars someday or whatever. And, and he got up and said, and our biomass production chamber only leaks 10% per day. And I was blown away. But that's the curve you would get if it leaked 10% a day. In other words, you can't tell that the oxygen is declining. You can't even tell. It's just, OK, you might notice a little blip here, a little blip there. But people would argue about it. And you, you wouldn't know, well, maybe it's leaking. 10% a day? Why? They didn't have a lung. There's no expansion contraction capability. And I asked somebody why, and the eyes rolled around. And he said, well, they didn't put duct tape out, enough duct tape on the duct, air conditioning ducts and stuff like that. But no, that's not the real reason. The real reason is they didn't provide for expansion contraction. That's the real reason. And this 10% per day matches almost exactly with what I had shown in that other graph of the persistence of original air. So next slide. OK, this is just of interest. Here's a picture of the guys putting glazing on the, on the glass, I mean, on the space frame. Next slide. There's another one. Paint, one pane of glass getting lifted up in place. Next slide. Now, here's what I was going to say about the liner. Underneath, there has to be a metal liner, otherwise it leaks. But then you have to ask yourself the question, what about structural columns? There are all these concrete columns that you see all the way in Biosphere 2, and you know perfectly well that they go through to a foundation in the ground. Okay, But wouldn't that mean there would be a penetration through the liner? And the answer is, yes, it would, except that what we did is, under every structural column, we put a stainless steel plate, which is this plate right here, 3 quarters of an inch thick, same kind of stainless steel. And we welded the liner edges to it. That's the weld right there. And then on top of the plate, there are rebar sticking up that will go into the concrete column. And on the bottom of that plate, which you can't see in this photo, there are other uh, rebars that are going down into the foundation. So that was the means of getting concrete columns to get structural support through the liner without making a leak or a hole in the liner. Next slide. OK, this is a photo of the rainforest in the early days of construction, before, of course, anything was put in place. And this is the, not, the, uh, not the liner. This is the concrete slab underneath the liner. And you'll notice these channels. These are embedded in the concrete that is underneath the liner. And I'm going to come back and show you more about 
how those channels were used in a little bit. Next slide. OK, and this is in the uh, intensive agriculture, which is now occupied by the Landscape Evolution Observatory. But in the basement, where those trays are for what was the uh, wastewater gardens. And there you see the liner underneath. Those are welded seams. <clears throat> and what you're seeing is a flood of water on them that's about a foot deep. And the point is that in those channels that were underneath the liner, we pump, pump compressed air. And of course, if there was a leak in any weld seam, then you would get a trail of bubbles coming up through the air. And we would know where the leak was. And we did find a few. So that was very uh, useful little exercise. Next slide. And this is another thought is that's an electrical wire, a big fat one like my thumb thickness. <clears throat> and of course, we have a lot of electrical power supply in Biosphere 2. And I'm saying to myself, well, you're going to bring a wire in to bring electric power in. You're going to go through the wall. Are you going to put this cable through the wall and put silicon seal around the edge of the cable where it goes through the wall and call that an airtight penetration of the electrical? No, because see all these little gaps between the wires and the inside. OK, so what we did is we put a solid copper bar through the wall, which was sealed. We brought the electrical cable to one end of the copper bar and connected it. And the other end of the copper bar inside Biosphere 2 connected another electrical cable and continued. And that way, we were able to seal the uh, electrical penetration that there wouldn't be any air leakage just because the penetration existed. Next slide. OK, now leak detection. <clears throat> I, like I've always said, sure, great ideas to build it. But can you build it without making leaks? And obviously, the answer is no, because it's just too big. But then you have, want to be able to find leaks. OK, so outside of Biosphere 2 on the edges, you see this yellow tunnel here? That's outside Biosphere 2 and going there. And there were also a few spots here and here and here. Um, but uh, that's a tunnel that was built for the purpose of leak detection. Next slide. And this is how it worked. So here's the inside of Biosphere 2 and trace gas indicated by those little dots in the air. And here's the liner, that red line. Don't know if you can see it's a red line right there. And there's something on the floor we call the topping slab, which is concrete we put over the liner just to protect it from abrasion and traffic and things like that. Underneath it is a structural slab. And here is one of those channels that I pointed out before and connected. But of course, the airtight seal is the liner. This is the airtight barrier. And what we're interested in finding out is if there are any leaks in that liner where the welding was done, if the welding was not done perfectly. So the channel there is placed directly underneath a weld. So where there is a long weld, there's a long channel immediately underneath it. So from that channel, we could actually suck air in the tunnel that's outside using a vacuum. And of course, the, there's a trace gas in the air in Biosphere 2, sulfur hexafluoride. And by sucking air on that connection to the channel and having a detector there, whenever there was actually a leak, the detector would notice that it would detect the sulfur hexafluoride. So, um, and then there was a vacuum pipe there, which enables us to suck a vacuum and so on. And uh, 
in that way, we could go channel after channel after channel, and we could actually locate leaks, or we could narrow them down. And I have a funny story to tell about that, which is um, in the early days, um, before we actually sealed, um, I was going around, or in the interlude between the two missions, I was going around with a little squirt bottle of sulfur hexafluoride. And the detector is there. And I would go around inside Biosphere 2, squirt, 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 squirt. And of course, if there was any um, leak in the area that I was squirting, then of course, some would be sucked into that detector and it would give a sound. Well, I didn't have a helper, so there's a telephone connection here in the tunnel. And I had a telephone in there, and then I had on my belt, I had a cordless, not a cell phone, but a cordless telephone. And I had the telephone in the tunnel called the cordless telephone. So I could walk around with the cordless telephone, squirt, 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 and if there was a leak, I would hear it go, ee, I, as I was, and I would know, because I was standing there where the leak was, and then I could narrow it down. I'd go squirt here, and squirt there, and squirt there, and squirt there, and I could actually locate leaks to within this close, and I could actually find them and see them, because I could see that there was a flaw in the weld uh, there, like a pinhole. I mean, these leaks were tiny, really. And I remember one in particular in the liner in the north wall of the rainforest. I just, it was under the ground about this much. Um, I was getting this leak. How could it possibly be, be a leak there? There's not even a weld seam there. Well, it turned out that as I narrowed it down and then dug for it a little bit, I found a hole about the size of a pencil. And the hole was because a welder had accidentally dr dropped his welding rod, which had touched the liner and burned a hole through it. And it was like, there it is. <laughs> that was, uh, but anyway, um, so anyway, that took there was a lot of time devoted to locating leaks. And then I had a system also for quantifying, like I could measure the airflow rate through the detection system and uh, measure the concentration of the leak that was being detected and make an approximate, very rough inference about how big that meant the leak was. And by the time I got done with all of that over a long period of time, I spent weeks or months doing it. I came to the conclusion that most of the leaks that I had identified earlier, you know, the, the finger size accumulation of holes, I came to the conclusion that probably most of the leaks were in the liner and not in the glazing, which was very interesting. Um, but I don't know that for sure because I didn't have an independent leak detection system for the glazing. Next slide. OK, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the lungs. These are the membranes. And you notice, the, uh, as they bulge up, there are these wrinkles. There's a wrinkle there. There's a wrinkle there. There's a wrinkle there. There's a wrinkle there. Why should there be wrinkles? Why shouldn't it be smooth all the time? Well, the reason is relatively simple if you think about it. Next slide. So if you consider a position on the membrane when the pan is in low position and measure its distance from the center, the radius is, I just made up this example in one. But then as the lung goes up, the membrane flexes and gets into this shape. And so that point actually moves outward to there. So that's in this example, that's like nine feet of difference. So if you don't have some excess material there, just by moving up, it will get stretched and will get torn just by the pressure and force of, of uh, being moved up. So that was the uh, reason for those wrinkles. Next slide. 
then there's also I got one little opportunity to pay to play a little part in the uh, architecture, which is what is the shape of these lungs? Well, if you build it large enough diameter, um, that is the domes of the lungs. Um, if you build a large enough diameter and continue that diameter, it would be really tall. It would be way up like that uh, in order to allow the clearance for the membrane to move up and down underneath. So I thought about that for a little while. Next slide. So I made it two different circles, one with a large radius for the top and a smaller radius for the edge, and then joined at the where they meet where the tangents are the same direction so that you don't see any demarcation line of the curve. It's just, there's no break line. It's just smooth. That was just a little, uh, a little thing. Next slide. And then the space frame, which you see around like, like here. Well, that's not a good example, but the space frame. This was Peter Pierce's invention is that you have the nodeless node, where all the struts converge to a point. Typically, what's been done in geodesic domes and space frames and so on is you have a node. and You connect every strut to the node and everything like that. Well, you get a lot of stress concentration by doing that, and it's a difficult thing. His invention was that you put these little ears on the uh, ends of the struts that connect to each other. So you see there's a hollow space in the middle. Nodeless node. Next slide. And this is just a, a, a glance at the ocean early on, um, just to give a sense of how big the ocean is. Next slide. Um, this is showing the heating and cooling system. And I think the arrows are reversed on this. Actually, I think the, the airflow goes the other way. But this shows how do you heat and cool Biosphere 2 without ventilating it. Most air conditioning in most buildings relies on ventilation. Um, but what has to happen is you need to have to circulate the air. So there are these air handler units in the basement. And air is sucked in one end. And then it goes across what we call coils. So there's a cool coil. And most of you probably know that over at the Energy Center, there are these cooling towers. There's three of them. Well, that's evaporating water. And when you sweat, for example, you cool yourself because water is evaporating on your skin. That's how you cool yourself. That's what makes one of the things that makes water cool. So direct circulation of that evaporated water to the first coil that we call cool, called tower water. And then there's chilled water, which is produced by compressor, which makes it very cool, like 40 degrees Fahrenheit. But then the air is so cold that it's uncomfortably cold. Well, why do you have to do that? If it's going to be colder than you need, why do you have to do that? You do that because humidity is in the air, and you have to get the humidity out. Why? Because the plants are picking up moisture from the soil and evaporating it into the air, and the air is com continually being loaded with moisture. And if you didn't have a way to get the moisture out of the air, the whole process would stop because the humidity would become 100% or near 100%. And then the plants would no longer be able to draw water through themselves and evaporate it. So um, you have to extract the moisture. And the way you extract the moisture is you cool the air so cold that the moisture condenses. And that's what's indicated by those little drips coming off. But then the air is too cold to um, be directly put into the space, it'd be 40 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So you have to reheat it, which is what the hot coil is for, to, uh, to uh, make, it, uh, make it reheated. 
Um, next slide. And then <coughs> there was a concern, OK, you have these two huge buildings, this which is now the Landscape Evolution Observatory, but originally was the intensive agriculture biome, and this big one, which is all the wilderness biomes. And I'm sitting here thinking about, well, here are these huge buildings. Who's going to say that they're going to settle exactly equally on their foundations over 100 years? And if they settle a little bit differently, then their connection, which of course you've got to make very tight in order for it to be airtight, um, um, you know, what's going to happen with the stresses as those move apart, even a tiny fraction of an inch? Okay, so what was done here is there's actually flexible joint uh, between the two so that if one moves a little bit differently than the other, there's not going to be breakage. Next slide. OK, over two years that the biospherians spent in there, this is what the carbon dioxide looked like. And basically, you see it going from um, the end of summer, beginning of fall, winter, coming spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer again. Um, so it responded to the sunlight because there's much less sunlight available in the winter. And, and that means less photosynthesis, because carbon dioxide is taken up by photosynthesis, which is when plants grow. And that's driven by sunlight, because that's the energy that they need in order to grow. <laughs> Next slide. And then this is a detailed study of carbon dioxide on four consecutive days matched with the sunlight intensity on the same four days. <clears throat> and what you see is that here's a, a, a cloudy day. The sunlight was not very much. It was low and was broken. And there you see the wiggle in the carbon dioxide in Biosphere 2, which resulted because of the lowered sunlight. So we used to joke and say, well, you don't have to look outside to see if there are clouds. You can just read the CO2 data, and then you'll know. Next slide. And in the rainforest early, this is before it grew up and has reached a space frame. Uh, there's the waterfall coming down. Next slide. Waterfall coming down into the pond below. Next slide. There's the pond below. Next slide. And the ocean, that's about 3 quarters of a million gallons. And we brought um, ocean water from the Pacific, not entirely, about 20%, I think it was, to fill that because we wanted all the microbial life that's in natural ocean water. We wanted all that activity, microbial activity, to be in the water because what we're studying is the way natural biomes uh, behave. So then we completed the rest of the water by uh, on-site fresh water mixed with commercially available sea salts. Um, but at least we got our inoculation of those uh, microbes. Now there's also something else which is at the far end there. Uh, we're very concerned about the survival of those microbes. And we had to move a lot of water. And typically, the way you move water is to pump it. So you have a pump. But inside a pump, there's this thing called an impeller. And it's spinning around at you know 1,800 RPM or even 3,000 RPM or more. And that's just an intense amount of violence that happens right there in the impeller. And of course, we figured that would kill the microbes. So how are you going to do the movements of water you need without doing that? Well, one of the things that we needed to do was we needed to have waves in the ocean so that there would be natural action. 
of waves. And that chamber, there's a big chamber back there in the back. Um, and underneath the water, which you can't see because actually underneath the water there, there's the open mouth all the way across the ocean. It's about this big and all the way across, 60 feet wide. And in the chamber there, we were sucking a vacuum. So that would suck water in the mouth and up in the chamber, and then momentarily release the vacuum. And that would, of course, then the, air, the water is no longer being sucked up. So it would fall down and surge out the mouth. And that's how the waves in the ocean were created without using pumps. Next slide. There's gay alling diving on the coral reef at the waterline. The rainforest in the background. Next slide. Here's the eight biospherians that were in the two-year mission. That's looking at them through the glass from the outside. The photographer was outside. Next slide. Marsh. This is the mangrove marsh. In order to stock the mangrove marsh, we brought mangroves from the Everglades in Florida. <coughs> and they came in these four foot by four foot by four foot tall crates that were filled with marsh soil and water and mangroves individually planted in them. Um, and they were carried in trailer trucks that had lighting equipment so that the mangroves would be given lighting like sunlight and water circulation system so that the water which was in those uh, crates could circulate as they would be accustomed to from Florida to here. <coughs> and there were th those weighed two tons each and there were 208 of them. And that's how we got the mangroves uh, into Biosphere 2. There's a funny story about that, which is when the truck got to the Arizona border, they have all these restrictions about the kinds of plants and animals you can bring in. Well, the border guard heard them say mangoes. You can't bring mangoes into Arizona. And no way. He didn't hear the word mangroves. And so that was a huge kerfuffle. And I don't know, it took a whole day or something like that to get it straightened out just because he didn't hear the word right. Mangroves, not mangoes. Next slide. The desert, as we originally planted it, looking out, there's the south lung in the background. <clears throat> and as I said, Biosphere 2 was a big experiment. So we started out with the desert, which was because we knew it was going to be humid in Biosphere 2. It was to be what is called a coastal fog desert. So there's a lot of humidity in the air, but there's not a lot of rain in a coastal fog desert. Um, but what we didn't count on was that in cold weather, the glass envelope of Biosphere 2 would get very cold. And so the humid, moist air in would condense on the glass, and then it would drip off and rain inside the desert. So the desert, instead of remaining a coastal fog desert, became like a shrubland. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the things we learned. <laughs> Next slide. And here's a section of the biosphere habitat. And we're sitting right about here right now. Um, just to give a little glimpse idea of the, of course, each biosphere had their own apartment. First floor was their living room. Second floor was their bedroom. And uh, next slide. There's. Uh, I think that was Mark Nelson's apartment, ground floor. And right at the corner, you see the spiral staircase. 
that was what went up to the second floor where the bedroom was. Next slide. And at the top of the tower was the library. And we had about a thousand books up there. And the biospherians could go up and read and stand on that glass floor and look all the way down. Next slide. And uh, OK, this is where the Landscape Evolution Observatory is now. That was the intensive agriculture biome, which is where they grew the food that they ate. And you can see they were growing a lot of different things. <clears throat> there were about 50 different cultivars that they used regular for food, and about 150 that they experimented with and did various things with. And that's about a half an acre. Next slide. There's Mark Nelson working in the intensive agriculture. Next slide. And Sally Silverstone also working there. Next slide. And we had animals. Goats, chickens, pigs, and fish. Of course, the goats gave milk, and the chickens gave eggs. And the pigs and fish, well, we ate them. <laughs> and in fact, the pigs ate too much. We couldn't feed all the pigs as much as they needed. And so in the end of the day, we slaughtered all the pigs and had a feast. And then there were no more pigs. But that was another thing we learned. The pigs ate too much. <laughs> Next slide. Kitchen, all electric cooking, because if you burn a flame in Biosphere 2, you're going to be gobbling up the oxygen. So all electric cooking. Next slide. Preparing food. That's Jane Pointer and Mark Nelson and Sally Silverstone. Next slide. And here they are having a feast. They made every excuse they could have to have a feast. They'd celebrate every little occasion, birthday, you name it, they would celebrate and have a feast. Next slide. And <clears throat> this is the famous Biosphere 2 handshake. So here's Mark Nelson on the inside shaking hands with John Allen, who, by the way, invented the whole thing. His whole idea came from John Allen of building a biosphere to experiment with. And Oleg Gazenko, a very prominent Russian scientist who worked in closed systems. And here's the handshake between the inside and the outside. Next slide. <coughs> Wastewater garden. This is for treating the wastes. That's both animal wastes and human wastes. So that it could be made recyclable. So the nutrients all went back to the garden, to the agriculture, so they weren't lost. Next slide. You've probably seen these around here. That's Claire Folsom, a scientist from Hawaii. <clears throat> and what he did was he got a flask and put a shrimp or a few shrimp inside and algae growing inside and let the algae grow to feed the shrimp. And the fish, the shrimp, of course, their wastes would be the nutrients for the algae. The algae would produce, by photosynthesis, oxygen for the shrimp to breathe. And the um, shrimp, when they breathe, they'll exhale carbon dioxide, which is what the algae needs to grow from. <clears throat> and what he found was Within the lifetime of the shrimp, these would never die. Um, but the shrimp wouldn't reproduce in those conditions. And so then, but the whole flask as a living system would never die. They, you would see them later filled with bacteria and changing colors and 
doing whatever they do, living, but they would never die for decades. Next slide. And this is in South America collecting termites for Biosphere 2. We stocked Biosphere 2 with 3,000 species of plants and animals and went out on big collecting expeditions to get the ones we wanted. And these are getting termites in South America. That's Peter Warshaw there, um, who's one of our researchers in the early years. Next slide. And here's Gay Alling diving in the Caribbean to collect coral reefs. <clears throat> and those went into Biosphere 2. Next slide. And this is the ship Heraclitus, which we, by we, I mean uh, me and 15 other people who were the initiators of this project built ourselves in Oakland, California. And Kathleen is sitting here was one of the builders as well. And uh, so there it is, uh, sailing in the Caribbean to receive the corals that you saw Gay diving for and picking up. And that ship has sailed uh, over 250,000 miles around the world. And uh, next slide. Energy Center. Biosphere 2 gobbles lots of energy. I'm sure a lot of people would love to say, isn't Biosphere 2 wonderful? It's the most ecological project in the world. Well, in some ways it is. <clears throat> but in terms of energy consumption, it's a big gobbler of energy. <clears throat> and how does that contribute to our ecological understanding? It shows you how much is done by the natural biosphere. Because um, if I remember right, I think our uh, fuel bill for the energy to run Biosphere 2 is about a million dollars a year. So we generate electricity, but heating and cooling water, which goes in and out of Biosphere 2 through sealed piping systems, inside sealed piping systems. So none of that water which is heated or cooled in the energy center, ever mixes with any of the ecosystem water in Biosphere 2. It's all kept separate, but the heat and the cold can transmit and exchange the heat and the cold. That's how Biosphere 2 is cooled, by the chilled water that comes from the energy center and the tower water, which is evaporatively cooled. Um, which is carrying the energy. It's not the water that's being exchanged. It's the energy in the water that's being exchanged. Next slide. <clears throat> this is one of the generators in the energy center. <clears throat> this is one and a half megawatts. There's also another one which is uh, two and a quarter megawatts and a third one which is run on diesel, uh, which is one and a half megawatts. And the diesel was basically a backup so that if this one or the other one or the natural gas supply failed, which run these generators, then we would still have ability to generate electricity. Um, so there are three generators there. And in a crunch, this one, which is one and a half megawatts, can at least keep biosphere functioning but it takes more than one and a half on the long-term average to be optimum. And there's a uh, chiller, an absorption chiller connected to it, which uses the waste heat from that uh, generator to produce chilled water, which is how biosphere is cooled. But this is primarily an electrical energy generator. Next slide. And these are the pipes that you see inside, which is carrying that hot water or chilled water 
to the air handler units, which are there. And those are the pipes carrying that water. But again, those pipes, do the water in those pipes never mixes or contaminates the water that's inside Biosphere 2. It's completely sealed and completely separate. And then there was an incident. <clears throat> When we were under construction, there was a pipe that got broken, and there was green colored water that leaked all over the floor. And uh, somebody went bananas and said, my god, that's antifreeze, and it's ruined the, the ecosystems and all that. Well, it wasn't, because that green dye was simply a leak detection dye. It was just to show that it was energy center water and not biosphere water. It wasn't antifreeze, but uh, this particular guy went crazy about it and thought it was the, thought the whole biosphere had been ruined because of this accident, <laughs> which it hadn't been. Next slide. And those are uh, one of uh, two 200 ton chillers in the energy center, which generates chilled water. And next slide. And that's an air handler unit. And these are big, as you've probably noticed. They're 12 feet wide, 9 feet high, and 30 feet long. And they can move 50,000 cubic feet per minute of air. And there are 25 of them in Biosphere 2, uh, not including the ones in this habitat area. Next slide. And there they are. There's a map of them and showing how they're grouped by power sources. Rainforest, savanna, ocean, desert, and the intensive agriculture area. Next slide. OK. <clears throat> now, a little thought about life in the universe. Well, as far as we know, as far as we can directly observe, the only life that exists on the universe is on this planet on Biosphere 1. And by the way, I'm sure all of you know, Biosphere 2 is named Biosphere 2 because Biosphere 1 is the planet Earth. We didn't claim to invent a biosphere. We just copycatted it. <laughs> um, so, um, but then ask yourself, what's the chances that there's, no, there's more life somewhere else in the universe? And the odds are overwhelming that the, it's there. Can't prove it, can't see it for sure, but here's a little talk about the odds. Next slide. OK, there's something like 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Each one of them has something like 100 billion stars on average. And by the way, what's a galaxy? The Milky Way is a galaxy. It's our galaxy. And we can see it. But you can't hardly see any other galaxy in the universe. Well, OK, there are a few faint ones that you can just sort of barely see. Um, but generally, they're found by astronomers with very powerful telescopes. And after decades of study, their conclusion is that there are something like 100 billion of them that they can see in the universe. And every one of them is huge, like ours. Each one of them has 100 billion stars. So suppose the chance, just suppose that the chance that there is a star that has a planet with life on it is only one in a trillion. In other words, only one chance in 10 that our galaxy even has a living planet in the entire galaxy. There are 100 billion stars, one chance in a trillion for there to be a star. I'm just making these numbers up. I mean, I didn't make those numbers up. Those are observational. But I'm just making up um, this one in a trillion just to illustrate the point. Well, if there's only a chance of one in a trillion stars that has a, a planet with a life form on it, that would still mean there's more than 10 billion biospheres in the universe. So. To me, it's a no-brainer. There's got to be life out there. I mean, we can't see any. It's far away. Next slide. OK, then the question is, well, what is a biosphere? 
It's actually only a few. It's got a lot of interdependent life forms, and they're self-sustaining, and they're evolving. And it's materially closed. Now, you might think the planet Earth isn't material closed. You can look up in the sky and see light years away to stars that are way beyond Earth. So what do I mean that it's closed? Well, it's closed by gravity. Gravity holds all the material, including the atmosphere, close onto this planet. And I'll say, there isn't any material that comes in or goes out. Well, OK, you'll comment that, yes, there are meteorites falling in. There are asteroids. There are stardust. There's all sorts of stuff falling in. But the amount of it is minuscule. If there wasn't any of it falling in, if there wasn't any at all, it wouldn't change the activity of life on this planet one whit. It wouldn't even notice. Well, yes, you can argue that 65 million years ago, a big asteroid hit Cancun and it wiped out the dinosaurs and all that. And I'll agree with you. I'm not going to argue the point. I totally agree. But OK, it was punctuated. And then there was a new biosphere for the last 65 million years. It's sort of, so what, the amounts that go in and out from the outside. So that was our fundamental idea. Um, well, materially closed, and then also open to energy and information exchange. Why? Sunlight shines in. All the plants on the planet, they grow from the energy of sunlight. And of course, information comes in and out. Um, you know, we can send radio signals to astronauts that are on the moon or, or send signals out into space or whatever. Um, so energy and information can go through. Just like in Biosphere 2, we had telephones and radios and computers. And we could look at each other through the glass. That's information going in and out. Um, so, uh, um, so these are, are crucial defining features of what a biosphere was. And our idea to build Biosphere 2 was to build that as experimental system. Next slide. OK, how can we study biospheres? Well, our idea was build them, operate them, and experiment them. Experiment with them. That is the fundamental idea of why Biosphere 2 was built. And of course, as I've gone through in the last hour or so, it was important that it be sealed airtight, or else it wouldn't be uh, a real biosphere. Next slide. OK, and then people say, well, we tried to build a replica of the planet Earth. Well, a replica is a rather exacting demand. Just like is what it means. Well, Biosphere 2 was not a replica of planet Earth. Didn't claim to be, didn't pretend to be. Why? OK, how about the size? 30 trillion times smaller than planet Earth, as measured by the mass of the atmosphere. Are the species? Not thousands fewer, thousands of times fewer. There are millions of species. We brought in 3,000 species. That's just a tiny drop in the bucket. And biomes, we only had five biomes there, and including the human habitat, this building, and the agriculture. Um, well, people disagree about how many biomes there are on the planet Earth. Some say there are 30. And anyway, we had, we had five wilderness biomes and two human-like biomes. Next slide. And then there are other big differences. There's no wind. OK, yes, right in front of an air handler, there's, there's a blast of air. But mostly, you stand inside a biome. You don't feel any, any wind or any significant wind. Very limited temperature range. There are no storms, no floods. Well, just today. Uh, Aaron showed me they're doing a little flood experiment in the rainforest, a little tiny flood. 
but mostly there are no floods. There's no drought. Well, we're now experimenting with some droughts a little bit, but not like is happening on the planet. No fire, no lightning. Solar intensity is reduced because it goes through the glass. There's a limited solar spectrum because the glass cuts out the ultraviolet, for example. There's no erosion really occurring. There's no stratosphere. So Biosphere 2 was not a replica of Biosphere 1. And those is just a sample of the differences. Next slide. The end. Thank <laughs> you.